want the gold standard. They're back there in Hollywood making movies right now because of us, because they believe in us and what we're doing. I'm on the phone with every studio at night, insurance companies, producers, and they're looking at us and using us to make their movies. We're cre creating thousands of jobs, you motherfuckers. I don't even want to, I don't ever want to see it again, ever. And if you don't do it, you're fired. If I, ever, if I see you do it again, you're gone. And if anyone on this crew does it, that's it. And you too, and you too. And you don't ever do it again. That's it. No apologies. You can tell it to the people that are losing their homes because our industry is shut down. It's not going to put food on their table or pay their college tuition. That's what I sleep with every night. That's the future of this industry. So I am sorry. I am beyond your apologies. I have told you, and now I want it. And if you don't do it, you're out. We are not shutting this movie down. Is it understood? If I see it again, you're fucking gone, and so are you. So you're going to cost him his job. If I see it on the set, you're gone, and you're gone. That's it. Am I clear? Do you understand what I want? Do you understand the responsibility that you have? Because I will deal with reason, and if you can't be reasonable, and I can't deal with your logic, you're fired. That's it. And with that, welcome to Early Stoppage, a show where the news of the day is sometimes given just enough time, but sometimes not enough. I'm John Franklin. I'm joined by the God Father of Fight Night Picks, Craig Allen. Craig, how are you? I'm well, John. I'm a little bit disorganized today, um, which is not normally like me. So yeah, it's a little bit uh, kind of like one of those days. And you know, every now and again, I get to go back and listen to some of the uh, the other Fight Night Picks content that's out there, and I get to hear that I'm the the second half or the worst half of Fight <laughs> Night Picks. So I like how you lie behind my back and not to my face about that. But either way, I'll let that all go today. I'm looking forward to today's show. You got me fired up. I'm going to have to uh, fire up the bleep button in post-production. So I'll take, a, I'll take a page out of your book and just say that Matt's young, and sometimes he needs his tires pumped. So uh, I never actually have fully committed to which is the better half of the Allen brothers, so we'll leave it up in the air. On this episode of Early Stoppage, we talk Jake Paul's high school pranks, Tony Ferguson's future, and Ronda Rousey's records. But we begin with Yo Romero. Craig Yo Romero is signed with Bellator. He will fight in the light heavyweight division. So let's attack this from a couple different angles. One, do you like the Romero signing from Bellator's perspective and Romero's perspective? And two, do you think this gives Bellator a better light heavyweight division than the UFC? I don't know if it gives them a better light heavyweight division than the UFC. It definitely makes things a lot more interesting because, John, I, again, king of the Bellator prelims as you are, you look at this division, there's a lot of prospects that are unknown. They're, they have a champion that I would say is unknown to most of MMA. I mean, how many big Vadim Nemkov fans are there out there? Apart from myself, Matt, and the Bellator fandom at large over on uh, the Facebook group, Bellator News MMA, apart from everybody there, I don't know who's really talking about Vadim Nemkov. You might hear the odd word from Joe Rogan because one of his guys told him who it was, but apart from that, you don't hear a whole lot about him. So, when you're kind of relying on, you know, Bader aging out, he's a heavyweight champ, probably going to commit to that from now on. Nemkov, Phil Davis, you got Beast in 25-8, Corey Anderson now, and now Yoel Romero, and now Anthony Johnson. You have to think that those guys are either going to fight at 205. I, I doubt it's going to be at heavyweight, but you never know. And Rumble's not making 85 anymore. So I, I think it's a great signing. I think that they're both really good signings. I would have preferred to see UL Romero with Combate taking on Tito Ortiz, as weird as that might sound. <laughs> but from a competitive standpoint, from a fandom standpoint, I mean, I think Bellator is the play. And John, I don't know if we're going to talk about it in this episode or not, but did you see who they also signed yesterday? Tell me. We're probably not. Uh, they signed. <laughs> they signed that girl that kind of dressed up a little bit like Harley Quinn and fought that guy that was like 500 pounds over in Russia. Oh yeah. Yeah. The the you know the fight that Mark Goddard thought would be the end of uh, combat sports and martial arts, and it just so happens that every now and again he referees for Bellator. So good stuff from Bellator. I I, I love <laughs> it. I mean they. They go out one day and they have a porn star making her debut. I know you like that tweet, but this time last year, Orion star adult movie star was fighting for Bellator in the prelims, making a pro debut. And this time this year, they're signing a chick that fought a 500 pound dude. And you all Romero, how the times have changed, John. I heard that one girl's great off her back. Um, so let's move forward. I'm not really a Vadim Nemkov guy. I'm more of a Victor Nemkov guy. 
that's a story for another day. Um, so listen, I, I like the Romero signing. I, I would have liked to, I like Combate Americas. I've covered it, so I'm a little biased, but um, I like Campbell McClare and I like, I just want to see, I want all these different promotions to find their thing. And I think there's enough. So the question is, is would you all Romero be more important to Bellator or Combate? Way more important to Combate potentially, and I'd like to, I like to see everybody sort of find their niche. I think Combate has the right niche. They don't have the right fighters for that niche quite yet. So Yoel Romero would have helped that. So I, I am interested in him uh, joining this this uh, this promotion in this division. I'm with you. I don't think it makes it a better division because in the end, a lot of the guys in this division are guys that UFC didn't want. Now, would they rather have them back now? Sure. But um, I, I don't know. I'll tell you what gets interesting, though. Side note. Uh, Ryan Bader and Rumble Johnson on Submission Underground this weekend grappling. If you ever, if you want to promote this division, this is a hell of a way to do it. They need to, they need to start some real heat in and around their their uh, grappling match. They definitely should. And I mean, talking about Yoel Romero, kind of parlaying it further. And I know it's something that we're going to talk about in a segment later on in the show. The UFC is kind of in a weird spot because they want to go on this talent purge, but they don't. They don't want to spend money on the high-end talent, but they do. It all depends. I mean, Jose Aldo's in the co-main event this weekend against Marlon Vera, so they definitely want to spend a little bit of money. But it was really surprising to me, some of the news that came out this week. And it was really Big John that actually had the controversial thing to say this week. When speaking about Tony Ferguson, he says about the UFC, I think they're going to cut him. I could be wrong about the reason... But the reason I say it is, first off, Tony has always had an adversary relationship with certain people with the UFC. He feels like he's being held back, cheated in certain things. And so you have that. That's okay. You can say those things when you're winning. And he continues on to talk about his last two performances. But, John, this got blown way up yesterday. Big John thinks Tony Ferguson should be cut from the UFC. Do you agree with him here? Should be and will be are two different things, but um, I would say this: Tony Ferguson's a pain in the ass. I mean, we can we can all agree on that. So that's part of it, right? That's part of the reason why you would cut him is because the UFC, no matter what they say, wants guys who are agreeable. And if they're gonna push back against the UFC and play that Stone Cold Steve Austin game of like you know Nate Diaz and Nick Diaz and all that, they want at least someone like Connor who's willing to play ball with them and get fights booked. So I. Here's where I think the UFC has to make a decision. Either the people that beat Tony Ferguson, you think, are championship caliber in their own right, and if so, it doesn't matter that they that Tony Ferguson lost to them, or you don't think that about them. So if you lose two to two straight fights to Gaethje and Oliveira, who could win the belt, and Khabib's gone, so really, I mean, it's all up in the air still. So I think that there's fights for Ferguson still. I mean, I think. He's put himself in a gatekeeping position, so he has to deal with that. But um, I think he still has value to the UFC. It's just a matter of, um, you know, that number. And I don't know where they're at with their contracts. Nobody likes to take a pay cut. But sometimes, like, in the NFL, you got to go to a guy and say, hey, man, we like you. We'd like you to stay, but not for this number. And you got to figure that out. So I, I, I like Tony Ferguson, but not at what he's probably getting paid. And I mean, the UFC is really tricky too, because you bring up an NFL thing. I'll bring up an NBA thing. I mean, you look at, you know, different point guards, I guess. Let's go George Hill. George Hill a year or two ago was making $19 million a year. And then you go from making 19 to 1.6 or Jeff Teague. He's another guy. He was making a ton of money. Now he's coming to the Boston Celtics making league minimum. So it's a really weird spot when you're an NBA player or you get a mid-level deal at 5.7 or, or what? There's another tier that's what, 9, 10 million? Like there's weird tiers in the NBA. It's not so much like hockey. It's not so much like baseball. But with MMA, you either get that top end salary if you're like a Jose Aldo, a legacy guy, or you're Tony Ferguson where – I'm sure there's some type of clause in his contract where even the interim belt accounts for something. As much as he or Justin Gaethje doesn't actually want the interim belt, they want the real belt. Well, they want the money too. So for a guy like Tony Ferguson, he's invested financially. For the UFC to try and cut Tony Ferguson, there's such a section of fans that love Tony Ferguson. Did you see that stupid picture that was floating around on social media about Tony Ferguson, a master splinter? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was the dumbest load of bullshit. And I know that the Twitter handle that threw it out there and I have them muted, but every now and again, something like that pops up my feed and I just shake my head, but I saw that pop up and I thought 
No, no. A lot of people like Tony Ferguson, and even though Tony Ferguson's on a downswing, people had him all the way up. People are going to have him on the way down. And whether he ends up with another promotion, hey, there's another guy. If Combate's got the money, sign Tony Ferguson. I mean, they have some really good uh, fighters in their lower weight classes. I'm not saying tomorrow I want to see Tony Ferguson say, uh, fighting uh, Umberto Bandanai, but why not? I mean, Tony Ferguson's lost his last two fights handily. He got out grappled by a grappler. He got outstruck by a striker. So what's left for Tony Ferguson? I look through those top 15 matchups and I see the guy that fought his last two fights the way he has. I don't know if Tony Ferguson has it left in the tank to take on top 15 guys. And I'm being dead serious. And I know we all thought at the start of the year, Tony Ferguson probably had a shot against Habib, but we have to face facts. I don't think this is a top 15 guy. I think, you know, for him to fight Showtime again, for him to fight maybe Cerrone again, but those fights won't happen because Tony finished those two guys. So it's really tricky to find a dance partner for Tony Ferguson at this point. Maybe you do cut your losses and let him go somewhere else. Yeah, maybe. Okay, Craig, let's move on. I want to talk to you about something. I'm going to call an audible here because there was something I want to talk about here in the third spot, but it's just too involved. And I know a way that I'm going to, I'd rather talk about it. And I'll even tip the audience off. We're going to talk about the UFC antitrust lawsuit. And, uh, but I was, I've been chatting with my man, Jason Cruz lately. He's a better guy to talk to that about. So I'm going to connect with Jason Cruz. We'll put that on keeping score. So let's call an audible Omaha, Omaha, Peyton Manning. Let's talk about Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland called out Derek Brunson. The quote is, I want to beat Derek Brunson up because I don't like the way he strikes. <laughs> it just looks awkward. It's like a disrespect to striking. It's sad that he knocked out strikers before with that weird striking. So um, this is just me kind of crowbarring Kevin Holland into the situation. Here's the thing with the Derek Brunson fight, and I want to get your thoughts on whether or not you like this, because Kevin Holland is, is, is turning into a star. And one thing you guys are going to notice on Early Stoppage, now that I'm back doing the recap show again, you're going to hear me talking about more about fights on Early Stoppage because I'm doing more prep for the recap show. So this you'll, you'll, it'll seep its way in. But anyway, so the Brunson, the Brunson call-out's interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on it because – is Brunson the next guy for Kevin Holland, in your opinion? It's a tricky one. And I mean, you know, without having the rankings up in front of me, because you really threw that Omaha, uh, you know, audible at me. I look at it in a couple of different ways. So Derek Brunson's been there and done that. He's fought Elias Theodorou. So, I mean, that's the top of the mountain. And he won that fight. I look at Derek Brunson and going into his last fight, it was, okay, is this guy spent? Or is he just a gatekeeper? What do we do here? And he beat the brakes off poor Edmund Shabazian. So he was a gatekeeper to Shabazian. Then you give him Holland. What do you think of Kevin Holland? Is Kevin Holland still a prospect? I don't think that he is. I mean, he's had 20 plus pro fights. You know, he's not the youngest of 20. So I look at the way that he, that the way that he fights. I think he poses an interesting stylistic matchup to a guy like Derek Brunson because what's Brunson known for? Good wrestling. This cardio is what it is, and he can power punch. He's susceptible to getting hit. Kevin Holland's the right test for a guy like Derek Brunson. Again, without having the rankings up in front of me, and I can get them, um, I would have to see exactly where those guys are slotted as to whether or not maybe a fight with Darren Till makes more sense than a guy like Brunson. But to me, and I've seen that Brunson name brought up quite a bit, I'm fine with it. I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, here's the good thing about him fighting Derek Brunson. And, and if I'm the UFC, I give Derek Brunson a little something extra in the Christmas paycheck because Derek Brunson has fought every fighter that you would want to have on the resume if you're going to have a young fighter. Like if you're going to start playing the game of like, who's a similar opponent between Israel Adesanya and, Der and Kevin Holland? Derek Brunson. A similar opponent between Kevin Holland and Aaron Silva, Derek Brunson. So he's fought all these guys. So when you start playing the comparison games and you want to say, well, this is what Anderson did to Derek, and this is what Kevin did. Kevin does to Brunson what he did to Jacare. Now you start comparing. I mean, it's MMA math, and it doesn't work in predicting fights, but it works in selling fights. So I think that that's a good way. Derek Brunson's a guy to use to, to sort of – increase Kevin Holland's um, star power, maybe put it, put to, you know, a highlight package together that you got Jacare. If he does his, if he does what he should do against Brunson, you start to build this kid in a certain way. Uh, he's going to do a lot on his own, just like Israel Adesanya did because of who he is. 
but I like this fight. I think why not? All right, John. So when we look ahead to the weekend that we're going to have this weekend, UFC Vegas 17, we were originally supposed to have Leon Edwards take on Hamza Shemaev. And I know on the recap show, you guys talked a lot about the fights that we were supposed to have last weekend that fell out. It was a big talking point, especially at the start of the show. And it's one of those ones when we look ahead to this weekend, there's 14 fights on the card. One's already fallen off. There's all kinds of fights at the bottom that have fallen off because a lot of men and women want to fight before the end of the year. I'm sure there's some tax incentives in there for them as well. And one of the major focal points is the fact that Shemaev is going to be back on with Leon Edwards and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson's kind of fallen in the middle of it. You know, he says that the push for Hamzat Shemaev kind of disrespects a lot of fighters that have been doing it for a long time, John. So do you agree with Wonderboy in this, uh, in this spot? And I mean, bonus points, if you can tell me, do you want to have Wonderboy Thompson on our channel breaking down more karate footage? Because I've seen it on two channels now. Are we the spot for that? No, I'm good. Um, okay. So, you know, I, I think that the Chimaev thing is weird because, you know, Chael said something interesting on one of his um, videos, which is if you think that comes at Shemaev is inappropriately ranked or being inappropriately pushed, then you should raise your hand and be willing to fight him. And if you're not, then maybe he is what everyone seems to think he is. So, it, you know, Stephen Thompson can handle this situation very easily. He could just agree to fight Kamzat Shemaev, and then he could say, see, I was right. This guy doesn't deserve all this promotion. But if he gets, you know, ragdolled by the guy, then maybe he, maybe he should chill out with what he's saying. I get it. MMA really isn't like a seniority type thing. It's not like how long you've been here. It's like every day you got to earn what you, you know, there's some guys coming for what you have. So you can either accept that for what it is, or you could say, I've been here so long. Didn't this guy have like three title shots and they were all uninteresting fights. Now, part of that's Tyron Woodley's fault, but like he had his shot, right? He was there. And if he had performed better, he would have had the belt around his waist and he didn't. So let comes at give comes at Shamaya of his shot. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. You look at the fight that he has coming up this weekend against Jeff Neal. Not an easy test. I mean, Neal's on a huge win streak. He's 13 and 2 overall. Do you know who his last loss was to? Tell me. Uh Kevin Holland. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Holland with XFC. But uh, you know, he's got a big test in front of him. Uh now Craig and Matt picking Jeff Neal. I don't know what that has to say, but yeah, if you're a guy like Wonder Boy. It's not a, hey, wait in line type of deal. You shouldn't be all upset about it. You have to go on and put on a good performance against Jeff Neal if you want to move up in the ranks, especially in your division. So for a guy like Wonderboy to say that, it makes me kind of question him a little bit. It's an odd thing to say. And Wonderboy is at the spot too, like you had mentioned. He's 37 years old. He's no spring chicken. He has, what, maybe 20 pro fights, which is kind of strange because it feels like he's been around forever. He's had those opportunities at the belt. Uh, you know, Tyron Woodley was successful one and a half times against them because you had the draw. But for a guy like Wonderboy, focus on the guy next week. I know that people are going to ask him this question. Don't put too much stock in it. Laugh it off. Do whatever you have to. But I wouldn't address this one head on. It just It's not a great look. And listen... It was a shot fired, but it was a joke at the start about Wonder Boy critiquing karate movies. I mean, listen, shoot your shot and get your video views if you can. But I, I like the guy, wholesome guy, upstate karate, doesn't curse or swear, cool stuff. But, like, fight more often and you'll get more title shots. Yeah, he's a good dude, but I think he's, you know, uh, I don't like the hater play by him. He's, yeah. he's, a, he's a nice guy that's not his brand. All right, Craig, when I wanted to introduce this uh, topic initially, I had one way I wanted to go with it. But again, Omaha, Omaha, Peyton Manning. I'm sticking with the topic, but I am going to uh, sort of flip the question a little bit. Let's talk about the women of the PFL, Kayla Harrison and Clarissa Shields. I mean, PFL has these two stars, and all they want to do is find a way to get them fights. Harrison's fight has been canceled because her opponent didn't make weight, and Shields has come out and said that it was her disillusionment with boxing that led in part to her departure to MMA. So I guess the, the original question was, should, should there be any concern from the PFL about these two ladies? I'm going to flip it and say, should these two ladies be concerned about the PFL? Meaning, should they feel like maybe their careers are, are, are in jeopardy and won't move forward in the way they should because the PFL 
I mean, listen, they're not the Keystone Cops. They're not the can't, you know, can't shoot straight gang, but they're not, you know, they, they don't have a season and, and they're, they're having to have Kayla go to Titan. I mean, are they worthy of these two athletes? There's a better way. I would think, it. you know, for Kayla Harrison, for the better part of seven or eight months this year, she was probably pretty worried. It was a hold and wait pattern. I mean, she has her million dollars from last year, right? So you know, financially, it might not be the biggest deal now. Yes, I factor in, you got to pay your gym costs, your manager, what have you. So it's not actually a million dollars and tax on top of that. But it is still a good chunk of change. It's more money than I have in my pocket. For Clarissa Shields, too, you know, you're a superstar boxer. You're coming into MMA with PFL. You probably have some good guarantees, and there's probably some extra money hidden aside that doesn't involve fighting. So she's probably all right there, too. The Kayla Harrison thing's weird. Uh, you know, having the fight with Invicta, it, to me, it made sense, right? Invicta is probably the organization that if you're going to shoot your shot and get an opportunity to kind of get yourself ready, that's the. Did you see the opponent she was supposed to take on with Titan? Yeah. Did, hadn't she fought her previously? Yeah. So Kayla Harrison, when she was 1 0, fought Josette Cotton, who. Listen, she was like a, a lightweight, a true lightweight. She had fought fights at like 165. She was a boxer, really tough, scrappy, eight and one. And Kayla Harrison wiped the floor with her. And then they were going to, Josette Cotton hasn't fought since then. That was 2018. They were going to have her fight her again. Josette Cotton, from all reports, weighed in around 180 pounds for a fight at 155. That's insane. That, that's crazy. So the Titan FC fight didn't make any sense. And for Clarissa Shields, they're going to keep getting her to do the rounds, make the media appearances with all the big companies. She'll do the interviews. They'll have her fight somebody like Orion Star, somebody making their pro debut, <laughs> nobody knows, somebody from Russia. She'll win that fight, and then we'll see what happens. But to really answer the question, should they be concerned with the PFL? Well, here's my question to you, John, and I'm dead serious and it's slightly rhetorical. Why aren't we talking about other PFL fighters right now? Because they're all on ice. What? But like Natan Schultz won the lightweight tournament twice. Lance Palmer won the featherweight tournament twice. Ali friggin' Asayev won the heavyweight tournament last year. Nobody's talking about any of these fighters. They're just talking about Kayla Harrison and Clarissa Shields. And good on PFL that A, we're talking about women's MMA, and B, that we're talking about these two fighters. But why aren't they trying to market their other stars? It's so weird because yeah. to me, they're in such a bad spot with those other stars. They threatened to sue the organization. They were upset with their contracts. Like the PFL signed Sung Bin Jo that fought one fight in the UFC. They signed Cesar Fajaya. They signed who else? They signed three or four different UFC guys. They haven't even talked about them apart from yeah. the initial, oh, we signed them. Why? Well, the other Pandora's box about this is whether or not they should be looking for fights for those guys or should, or should they just, you know, I'm not talking about the guy that, that, you know, and, and I don't know this to be true or not, but I'm just saying, you know, to, to assume that Lance Palmer and Natan Schultz are fine because they won the million, they want to fight. They want to get out. They sign with you to fight and they probably want to make more money, go after the next million or do whatever. And the fact that you're letting Kayla Harrison fight in Titan and not, and I don't know if these conversations have happened and they said, no, you know, Lance Palmer's like, nah, I'll wait or Schultz or, or if they're saying, you know, it seems like they're very flexible with Kayla Harrison's contract, but not as flexible with the others. So that's uh, disconcerting. John, you know, I want to move this in a totally different direction because now I'm upset about the PFL, but I was fairly upset yesterday when everyone and their dog in my regular life went, and, and I'm not lying. I, I'm, I'm going to go inside baseball on this one because this is a weird show. This has been a weird one. So uh, we were on What Happens Here last night. Myself, Matt Allen, Ariane Celeste, uh, Marcus, and uh, Matt. And it was a great show. It went really well. We had a lot of fun. We went full Rain Man and started talking about the fights. And I mean, I think I saw The Matrix halfway through. It went, it went good, though. And then after the show, I go to play hockey. And the guys that play in my hockey league, they don't know fights. And they don't even know that I do this. Most of them don't, but one of them does. So in front of a room full of guys, he's like, hey, Craig, what did you think when Jake Paul threw all that stuff at that guy? John, Jake Paul's been in the news a lot this week, for better or for worse. Did Brendan Schaub plan all that? 
I can't prove it, but I think that he did. And yesterday you threw out a tweet and we'll bring it up on screen right here. John, my question is this. We get a lot of flack when we cover, you know, the celebrity boxings, or maybe you don't, but I do. And, you know, MMA fans don't necessarily love the whole celebrity boxing type thing. But here's the question, and I know you tackled it head on. Should How serious should MMA take Jake Paul? And how much media attention should all of this be getting? You know... I don't know, man. I, for me, I think that what it boils down to is I think Jake, here's the, here's the thing about Jake Paul. I think that he takes his boxing career somewhat serious. Now he's not looking to get to be a real boxer, but when he goes in there, he's looking to take it seriously. Hopping in the back of a truck and throwing water balloons, at Dylan Dennis. Uh, you know, he, I think he was on the, um, the diaries, uh, the food truck diaries last week, and now Dennis is on it this week. That looks fishy, like you said, in terms of Brendan Schaub. This is right up Brendan Schaub's alley of something to do. So for me, I think that, uh, you know. Pretty good impression, right? It is a pretty good impression. I, I think that the reason why I put the tweet up that I put up was to say this. If you're into that, there's sites that will cover that. If you're not into it, there's sites that don't cover it. So so you can kind of go in your own direction. I would like to see Jake Paul taking this a little bit more seriously, but he's a YouTuber, man. What can I really expect from him? He's in this to make money. And Dylan Dennis will make him money. And Conor McGregor will make him money. I think if I'm Conor McGregor, uh, who Jake Paul's also called out, all I do is talk about Logan Paul, if I'm Conor McGregor, just to screw with Jake Paul. Because in the, in the end, I think Logan's probably a bigger deal. So if I'm Conor, I'll go, yeah, I'll take – Jake Paul seriously when he's as big as his brother. I think that's the move is, 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 is sort of, you know, being reductive when it comes to Jake Paul, but, uh, and dismissive, but yeah, man, I don't know. I mean, the kid doesn't bother me. He went in there with Nate Robinson and did what he was supposed to do. So until he goes in there with somebody and doesn't do what he's supposed to do, I'm gonna let him do his thing. Jumping in the back of, you know, trucks is a little lame for me. Yeah, I mean, it was a little lame. And I mean, to to kind of tackle, you know, the question and the tweet that you had as well, you know, am I perfect? No. And did I deserve a little bit of flack for talking about a Jake Paul fight with Nate Robinson? Sure, I, I guess. I mean, you know, people were already upset with the fact that we took the week off from the MMA picks, so they figured they'd just kind of rag on us for doing celebrity boxing. But it, to me, it was a little bit more than that because you had the Tyson Jones name attached to it, and that was the marquee, and that's what we were focused on. With the whole Jake Paul thing, though, it was just a little weird, you know, watching those sites. Rather than talk about the sporting aspect, it was almost like, here's MMA's TMZ. Let's just kind of talk about what happened. So it was odd for me to see that. And I, again, I thought it was kind of funny because one of the sites had a, a CM Punk uh, article. <laughs> when has he ever been relevant in MMA or, or how long has it been? But uh, yeah, it's, it's just an odd one. You know, again, that conspiracy will probably, you know, whether it gets debunked or not, it'll probably stick around for a bit. But yeah, I mean, Shab's boys with Logan Paul, Dylan Dennis was on Food Truck Diaries. You connect the dots and they don't really go that far. So we'll have to see what happens there. It, it was a weird one, though, for me yesterday. Um, I'm assuming it's probably a one off. And uh, I'm sure a lot of those sites probably got some flack because I know I did at the time. So I'm sure they did, too. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that conspiracy will be, be, be debunked pretty quickly. Brendan Shaw can't wipe his ass without telling the world. So I'm sure that this, he's not going to be able to keep this under wraps if he had anything to do with it. He wants to take all the credit. So, um, yeah, man, this whole thing, like you said, it's 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 a weird – the funny part about the, the, the different promote uh, sites, because I only tagged two in it. The one that you're talking about was actually the one that was most interactive with me about it. It was like, yeah, well – you know, they were taking the moral high ground, I guess, or whatever, or, or trying to be, you know, the, uh, they were giving me the Chuck Mendenhall where they're telling me the, you know, they're trying to be ironic. All right, Craig, let's move on to sparring sessions today. I don't know if you're aware. It's the 10th anniversary of the Showtime kick. You certainly are aware if you're on Twitter today at all. Um, I was there. It was here in, in Fe it was in Glendale, but it was in Arizona. Uh, last show of the WEC, Arizona fighters did not do well that night. Um, Jamie Varner got choked. And, and here's, the, this is what, let me give you a little bit of context for this show. This is the last show in the WEC. So everybody on that show knows 
that they may or may not go to the UFC based on how they perform. And it was, you know, I don't think Jamie Varner came over initially. I think he came over later because he looked not that great. And um, so Showtime kick. Here's the sparring sessions for today. Is it the greatest move you've ever seen in an MMA cage? No. Uh, okay, w within the context of that fight being so high profile, it was awesome. It was amazing. Um, was it the best thing I've ever seen in an MMA cage? No, and I'm going to give it a hipster's pick, and you're not going to like this. Um, and this actually happened in the last calendar year. Raymond Daniels' 720 move that he had on Jason King was absolutely insane. And that's the trouble. It's not the same level of competition. But when you can go in there and do that and just put it on flawlessly and knock the guy out, I mean, to me, that was one of the most amazing thing I, things I've ever seen in MMA. I replay it all the time in my head. The Showtime kick's awesome, but then I look at what happened. Well, did he knock out Benson Henderson? UFC highlight packs would make you believe it. Or WEC highlight packs or Zufa highlight packs. <laughs> no, he didn't knock him out. He won the fight, and then he lost to Clay Guida right after that, did he not? He did. So Clay Guida just derailing the hype train. Uh, but it's, it's an awesome kick to me. I go with that Raymond Daniels move. I, I play it over and over again. And if it's not that, then I'll go with another Bellator all-timer. Fedor hitting Rampage Jackson flush in the forehead. And Rampage Jackson go down. You know, my, so my, I got a three-way tie. And if you'll stick me to one, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. My three-way tie is Anderson Silva's front kick on Vitor Belfort. Um, Yair Rodriguez's up elbow on the Korean Zombie. But I think if, I, if you're sticking me to one, here's my one. When Demetrius Johnson picked up Ray Borg and dropped him into an armbar. That's probably the most impressive thing I've ever seen in a cage. Because my, it was like, because it was like, it just was unexpected. And it was like a complete domination of someone. It's something you would do to your like little brother. And you know? I, I don't want to one up you. I just want to go in agreement with you. Because again, got into MMA for Machida Shogun GSP. When poor Vitor was at the end of his UFC run, a Machida front kicked him. Yeah. What he did like to Randy Machida has a couple. What he did to Randy Couture, yeah. All right, let's move on to keep too. promote cut. I'll let you take the take the steering wheel on this one. So, John, with keep promote cut, it's always an interesting one because the way that we look at it is through the lens of these fighters are struggling and the UFC is already in well, it's really cut, cut, cut mode. So we look at some of these fighters through the different divisions and decide whether or not the promotion should keep that fighter. Should they promote that fighter and push them a little bit more or just cut ties totally? So I went division by division. I have four different divisions. We have Bantamweight, uh, Welterweight, Women's Flyweight, and Heavyweight. And we start off, John, with Bantamweight. Marla Marais, who's fighting this weekend against Rob Font on a losing streak, Jose Aldo fighting this weekend against Marlon Vera in the co-main event, three-fight losing streak. And Pedro Munoz, who's dropped two in a row, his last one to Frankie Edgar, a very close fight. So if you look at these three, keep promote cut. What are you doing here? I'm an old-school guy, so I don't think that you can cut someone with Jose Aldo's name. You let that guy go out on his terms. Now, some of these guys don't want to go out on any terms, which which makes it, you know, you got to have a tough conversation. You got to bring them into – to Rogan's uh, podcast and tell him that, you know, I think he might be surprised and maybe that'll get him to retire. Who the hell knows? Start telling some, tell him some fibs and let a guy throw garbage out of a truck at your show. There you go. Um, so for me, it's keep Jose Aldo promote Marlon Marais. I think there's a lot there that they're just not, they just haven't been able to, to, to get a hold of and Pedro Munoz and, and I, spoiler alert. I'm probably going to cut the most boring guy in each one of these lists, but um, yeah. So for me, it's keep Aldo, Promote Marais and cut Munoz. Munoz had that weird thing where he fought at UFC Halifax and then after that pot for PEDs. So that was kind of weird and a maritime connection to Pedro Munoz. I actually would promote Pedro Munoz. You can kind of say, well, he had that tight fight against the legend, Frankie Edgar. Let's keep him around because he bangs. Um, I keep Jose Aldo. I cut Marlon Marais and I like him. And I like him against Rob Font this weekend. The trouble with Marlon is he's... He's lost. He beat Jose Aldo, but it didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. You look at the guy, he keeps getting finished, and his heyday was World Series. It wasn't really UFC. So for me, Marlon, you cut him. He goes somewhere else, so be it.
we move along to welterweight. These ones are tough. I have key promote cut with Tyron Woodley, Nate Diaz, and Cowboy Cerrone. Small timers. You know, I'm going to go keep. Uh, this is a tough one because I can't quite figure out who to cut. I mean, I'm sorry, who to promote because they're all kind of older. You know what I mean? And Nate Diaz and Cowboy Cerrone to me are both equally promotable in the sense that they both have um, – they have similar fan bases in size, but different in demographic. So different people root for them, but they're but they, they have about the same following. I wouldn't I wouldn't be that surprised that they were like twenty thousand followers apart in Twitter, just because that's how I view their celebrity. Um, so okay, I'll, but I'll stick with. I think you keep Cowboy, you promote Nate because there's bigger fights for Nate. Um, we, we've been waiting forever to get him, but they're bigger fights for Nate. And then you cut Woodley because what can we do with this guy? We're, we're kind of out of it. Keep Woodley, promote Diaz, cut Cowboy. I mean, to me, Cowboy's way over the hill. His last five fights are what? Four losses and a no contest in his last one, which was really a draw. But, you know, Nico Price going to Nico Price and smoke that dank herb. So I, I get rid of Cowboy in that sense. I mean, he's fought some good competition, obviously, but uh, I think he's the most over the hill. So if we look up... To women's flyweight, Andrea Lee. She's on a three-fight losing streak. Courtney Casey on a streak, and she's had to switch weight classes. And Ariane Lipsky, who lost her last fight to Anthony and Shevchenko, didn't look good and really just hasn't lived up to her kind of ceiling since she's joined the UFC from KSW. So I'm going to go ahead. Courtney Casey's one of these weird people that always fights well but doesn't have a great record. And I don't Marina know. Marcos. Yeah, I'm just not into Andrea Lee. So I'm going to keep Courtney Casey because I think she's she's somebody that fights the level of her competition. I like that about her. She's a Phoenix fighter, so obviously that that automatically takes any thing I say completely out of uh, any credibility. But um so so yeah, I'm going to keep Casey, promote Lipsky and cut Lee. Yeah, I'm pretty well in agreement. I mean, Lee was supposed to fight, if it wasn't last weekend, it's this weekend. She broke her nose, so she's out of her fight. Three fight losing streak, the first two are by split. The last one's by unanimous decision to Roxanne Modafferi. To me, if you, you can't beat Roxanne Modafferi at this point. I know she's a tricky fighter, but she's, what, 37? Best friends with Jordan Levitt. So to me, you cut Lee, you promote. Yeah, Lipsky, I guess, and you, you keep uh, Courtney Casey because, I like you said, does fight to level over competition. So if we move up to heavyweight and end this one, keep promote cut. Junior Dos Santos has been finished four times in a row. Blagoy Ivanov, who's on a losing streak, and Big Ben Rothwell, who just, since he's come back, he's still big, he's still Ben, but he's not really winning fights all that much. You know... Uh, my heart tells me to cut Junior because because of the number, right? The and, and part of the reason I think that you cut Woodley earlier and I didn't mention is that I'm sure that he has a number that is um, like he wants to fight Nate Diaz. So you're gonna you're gonna write Nate Diaz a check once every couple of years, maybe. This guy's a little different in the sense that he wants to be active. I think the same thing with Junior. Junior's probably got a big number, and um, what's he really giving you for that number? Probably not much. So I'm getting rid of Junior, um, promoting Ivanov, and I am, uh, and I'm cutting Rothwell. Or no, I'm sorry. I'm, gonna... I'm cutting JDS. I'm promoting Ivanov, and I'm keeping Rothwell. You could promote Ben Rothwell a little bit. You could also still promote JDS. You could promote the fact that Blagoy Ivanov gets stabbed in the heart and after two months came out of the hospital walking with like little to no muscle mass. You ever watch that video? No. Really weird. Bellator liked to promote it when they still had him. You could do whatever you want with all these guys, but yeah, I'd probably cut JDS. It's unfortunate. I'd promote Ben Rothwell and I'd, I, I'd keep Blagoy Ivanov because... It's just tough, and I never talk about this, but it has to be said. I mean, Blagoy's fighting style and the fact that he doesn't speak English really doesn't translate to the masses. He's not the most exciting heavyweight you've ever seen. He's a Sambo champ. He's great, but 
It's just tricky. So you just keep them, I guess. All right, Craig, let's move on to For the Grand. Mackenzie Dern wants to break Ronda Rousey's records. She said after her fight with Verna Jandioba, Jandaroba, Jandidoba, the following. I kind of just set my goal on breaking records. Dern said, Ronda broke records. I'm going to break more records. I'm just focused on that one straight line. You know, the horse has the blinders. It was a pleasure for me that everyone was saying that, but it was pretty easy for me to focus on my goals and try to be a legend. So, you know, she's comparing herself to Ronda. I feel like. Or is she comparing ago, herself to a horse? I, you know, maybe she's comparing herself to Secretariat. Um, so I don't. Listen, I feel like 100 you know, years ago, we had the Mackenzie Dern, Ronda Rousey conversation on another network in another incarnation of this show. Now she's kind of owning it. Um, listen, I mean, we can't have a conversation about Mackenzie Dern without talking about the elephant in the room now that I'm talking about fights again, which is her dedication now to striking, Perillo being one of her coaches, and how, like, even in this last fight, it looked like she wanted to be a striker. So, one, do you think that setting Ronda Rousey as your goal is a good thing to do? And two, could she even surpass her based on a commitment to striking? I think it's a great goal to have. I really do. I mean, especially training with Perillo, who's had Chris Cyborg um, as a, you know, a person to coach here in the the not so distant past. And I mean, Chris Cyborg has really changed her game since she aligned with Perillo. Her boxing's gotten 10 times better. I mean, you look at the fight that she had against Julia Budd. I don't know if you watched that over with Bellator or not, if you <laughs> followed her, but she looked amazing. And I'm still kind of hung up on your secretariat comment because being uh, you know, a loyal and faithful Canadian uh, from New Brunswick, Canada, did you know that Secretariat was jockeyed by a New Brunswicker? Did you know that? I didn't know that. See, I'm like the Nardwar. The Canadian Nardwar. No, but he's also Canadian. Uh, yeah, Ron Turcott from Grand Falls, New Brunswick, Canada. They have a statue and everything. It's pretty cool. But How big's if the I statue? Focus... What's that? How big's the statue? Well, it's a little guy on top of a big yeah, It's horse. a jockey joke. I got it. Yeah, it's a jockey joke. And, you know, <laughs> listen, I got to stick up for my New Brunswickers. But... When I look at Mackenzie Dern, as far as goal setting, I think that's great. I mean, Ronda Rousey is a great person to uh, to look up to. I mean, and who else are you going to go for? You're going to list Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunes, Chris Cyborg. You don't hear many people going, geez, you know what? Alexis Davis, she's got a lot of fights. She's a Canadian. I'll look up to her. Maybe the Canadians will, or Sarah Kaufman. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I, I think it's a good job. That fight was close, though. That fight was close like a little bit too close for comfort and she got outstruck in the second round until she landed that uh, eye poke. And then that was, that was all she wrote really. Yeah. It was closer than it had to be probably. Um, I think that for me, you know, not everybody's going to get there, but she certainly has the tools. I, I like you bringing up Chris Cyborg. I was actually going to talk about a little bit about Bisbing or, um, you know, obviously Tito trained with Perillo for a long time. BJ Penn did as well. BJ Penn, I'm sure Perillo probably would mention on his resume, maybe not Tito, but um, the thing I like about talking about Cyborg is that with Perilla having that relationship, you know, she might get some time in the ring with Cyborg. They might be training together, which would help her immensely, probably as much as getting coached by Jason Perillo. But, um, you know, not everybody's going to get to that lofty level. But if you set those goals, listen, Kobe Bryant wasn't Michael Jordan, but he was damn close. So if that's your goal that you're setting, then there you go. I think that's a, not a bad goal to have. And if you're going to, you know, uh, shoot for the moon. If you miss, you still get the stars, right? Isn't that, isn't that what they say? That's, right, what, that, that's what they have up in classrooms, right? <laughs> Let's move on to one Twitter hitter. Uh, Max Holloway said he would fight Volkanovsky a uh, hundred times just to show who the better fighter was. Craig, two questions. Are you done with this matchup and follow up? If Luke Thomas watched the second fight 40 times, how much can we expect him to watch all these fights? I mean, would it just really just take over his life? Would he just be obsessed with Max Holloway and Volkanovski replays and, and breaking them down? Ah, get out of here. I got to watch Volkanovski again. It's like that episode <laughs> of The Twilight Zone where the woman just watches the movie she's in. Um, Isn't Volkanovski fighting Ortega? Isn't that the news today? That's As we are live right now, that seems to be the play. And I think it makes a lot of sense. So the, the trouble with Holloway is what do you do with him if he beats Calvin Cater? Uh, do you match him up against the Korean zombie? Do you match him up against, I don't know, somebody in the top 10? I would think it has to be a top 10 guy. And then you get into the top five and you get into the weeds. So I would be fine with seeing a trilogy. 
And it's weird because Volkanovski won the first two. So, you know, normally you wouldn't make that trilogy fight, but they were so close, or at least one of them was really close. Why not? I mean, the second one wasn't so. If you had Max Holloway on a full camp, a normal camp under regular circumstances, maybe you get something else. So maybe later on in 2021, we set something up like that. Hopefully there can be fans in attendance. Maybe the UFC goes back to Hawaii or just goes to Hawaii because, John, you know who <laughs> – keeps going to Hawaii Bellator yeah Bellator. I missed it yeah you, you know it. Oh, well. it, it's weird when it's two and that, that that one guy has because you know I mean I I didn't major in mathematics when I was in college but I can figure this one out if Holloway wins the third one then if you're Volkanovsky why don't you ask for the fourth okay so now Holloway wins the fourth we're gonna do a fifth like what I mean it, it just you, it just, just opens up this box of possibilities that if if you, if you give the fight to Holloway you have to respect the fact that Volkanovski won the first two. So I guess for me, I think these guys need to go away from each other for a while. And I think that there's a path uh, for Holloway to get back to Volkanovski. But it's not these five-round decisions where he looks good. But he needs to start getting some finishes. And he needs to cement himself as the clear number two guy in that division if he wants to get this fight again, in my opinion. <laughs> The right time for, for the fourth fight, John, is 10 years down the line with Bellator, like Rampage Vanderlei for. A lot of Bellator talk today. A lot of <laughs> Bell- like, I feel like uh, Ed Norton and Edward Norton and Rounders. He's like, lots of action where they do Matt Damon's not, not betting. Uh, all right, let's move on to post. Mad post- his money. <laughs> Craig Mike Perry called out Nate Diaz this week after Nate had some back and forth with Jake Paul, um, which was very interesting. Nate, Nate going back and forth with Jake Paul. Uh, so my question is, I mean, is this a drill? Is this someone's fan fiction? Is Christmas coming early? I mean, Mike Perry and Nate Diaz is about as great a fight as you would want. Is there any chance we, 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 we're going to see this? I mean, it's kind of a scumbag's main event. But at the same time, it's like, why would you take this fight if you're Nate Diaz? You wouldn't, right? Did you watch Mike Perry's last fight? No. I did. did Nate Diaz? Yeah, I don't Did think Nate so. Diaz watch Mike Perry's last fight. Mike Perry is not very good at fighting, doesn't have good corners, and doesn't <laughs> seem to care about fighting. And he's regressed as a fighter since he's come into the UFC. If Nate Diaz took that fight, it'd be the easiest fight in Nate Diaz's career. That might sound crazy to say. Nate Diaz could hop off the couch and beat Mike Perry on a Saturday night with a blunt in his mouth. You know, Nate here's the funny- Diaz would wipe the floor with Mike Perry. Here's the funny part, is that the reason why I did this for posting to the book is because I saw it. Shouts to our friends on You MMA want my Street. grandmother to see this? I do. Um, oh. he, but here's why I'm interested in this, because you and I, this is about the most dismissive fight that I could offer up for you, right? Where you're just like, come on, please. This is a no-brainer. But casuals will love this. They love the idea of it. They love everything about it, right? And here's what I think is funny about Mike Perry. And this is why you got to love the guy. There's a lot of reasons why you should hate him. Here's one reason why you got to love him. He's calling out Nate Diaz. Conor McGregor couldn't get Nate Diaz off the couch. Jorge Masvidal couldn't get Nate Diaz off the couch. All these guys that want the Nate Diaz fight couldn't get Nate Diaz motivated enough to come back to the UFC and yet, for a second fight. Now, obviously, Jorge got him for that for their last fight. but And yet, Mike Perry says, you know who I think we sh- I, would be a hell of a fight for me? Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz. There's a gr- I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick you to it right now. Greater likelihood Nate Diaz fights Jake Paul or Mike Perry? Jake Paul. Isn't that crazy? This is the world we live in. The world we live in. Created by Tim Means when Tim Means beat Mike Perry. Let me ask you the next one. Because we talked about what uh, Ben Askren thinks about um, Mike Perry in terms of like, uh, I'm sorry, what Ben Askren thinks about Jake Paul in terms of he's trying to look like a tough guy, not be a tough guy. Um does Jake Paul, Paul have his balls big enough to fight Mike Perry? Do you think Jake Paul would even fight Mike Perry? Yeah. He boxer probably. Yeah, but the trouble is, see, Mike Perry looks like a stereotypical fighter, so that might be a turnoff for Jake Paul. Here's where it gets weird, and I know that we do the boxing versus MMA conversations all the time, but it's funny. That and, and and boxers are always going to say, you know, it's tougher to be a boxer. You're you're at more risk of danger being a boxer. Blah 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 blah. And and whatever they have their they have their reasons for saying that. But no one ever. There's no such thing as celebrity MMA. 
because you wouldn't screw around with MMA in that way. Boxing, you feel like if I get in shape, I can protect myself. In MMA, there's no protecting yourself. If you go in there, you are putting yourself at the mercy of the guy you're fighting if he's better than you, right? MMA, it's like, I mean, boxing, you get hit a little bit, you turn your back, the ref jumps in, that's it. That's not, you You, you don't get out of MMA easily unless the guy wants you to get out. James Tony got out of things easy because Randy Couture wanted him to get out of things easy, not because of what who James Tony was as a fighter. All you got to do is tap like St. Pierre, Pierre against uh, Matt Sarah. That's all you got to do. That's, then it's all over. You, that's all you have to do. All right. Uh, new segment. Uh, this just in, because there's a few things that didn't quite fit in the rundown, but I want to talk about them. And some of them are actually, uh, they came in after we wrote the rundown. So let's do just, this just in. Uh, Craig, this just in. Dan Hooker says a lack of crowd is the reason for Charles Oliveira's win over Tony Ferguson. Um, do you think that's the reason? Is that why Charles Oliveira beat Kevin Lee too in Brazil? Because they got rid of the crowd a day before the event. <laughs> no, you joker. No, according to Dan Hooker. According uh, I to agree. Dan Hooker, this just. I didn't. think. I think Charles Oliveira is. Um, and we talked about this on the, this on the uh, recap show, which you can f- listen to on Spotify, YouTube, and all your favorite places to listen to podcasts. Um, which is that Charles Oliveira strict to schedule isn't that impressive. So for no. all we know, he could have been doing this all along, right? So so the question is the question we ask all the time, right? Is Tony Ferguson washed or is Charles Oliveira suddenly this, this championship caliber fighter? That remains to be seen. But I guess, um, yeah, I don't think it had anything to do with the crowd either. All right, let's move on. Dana White did a interview today with Carolyn Pierce. He had a few things to say. say uh, these are quotes uh, courtesy of Aaron Bronstetter by way of Carolyn Pierce, which there's an Aaron Bronstetter joke to make there because of the time that Aaron Hawani interviewed The Rock and then Aaron Bronstetter interviewed Aaron Hawani about interviewing The Rock. So he sometimes <laughs> likes to be, you know, a couple degrees of separation from what happened. But we love Aaron, wherever he is. I'm sure he's a huge listener of, of the podcast. Um, Dana White first talked about John Jones. He said, I, John and I had the best conversation we've ever had about a week ago and he's ready to come back. His head's in the right place, and he and I are in a really good place. Is this um, – I'll borrow from another segment that we've done before, but do you believe, Dana? Yeah, I do believe him in this one. Um, you know, John Jones is due for a fight. It's been a while since we've seen John Jones. He's probably a little envious of that championship goal. The 205 isn't around his waist. It's going back to Poland. Going back to Poland. Is that a song? We can make it a song. John <laughs> Blahovich back to Poland. It's a Christmas song. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think that they're probably in a good place. John Jones seems to be primed and ready for 230 pounds, where he roughly weighs at. So heavyweight dawning for John Jones. And, and I believe Dane in this case. Yeah, me too. I think that, well, I believe him. But, but let me just say with the caveat that I think Dana likes John at heavyweight. I think there's a lot of big fights for John. So I think Dana wants to cash those John checks, if you will at heavyweight, and then have him come back to fight Adesanya. So he wants them to do some work, take out Stipe, take out Nganu. And I think that it, it, I think that it's John's work at heavyweight that makes the Adesanya fight, in fact, bigger. Because if John yeah. can beat Miocic, then when he comes back down to fight uh, Adesanya, that's a, that's a monster fight. One other thing Dana said was he talked about the women's strawweight division. He said, what I'm hearing is Rose does not want a title shot, so we're looking at the rankings and how it plays out. It would play out for Wiley. And Carla Esparza. Now, a couple things. Uh, did we not just have a fight of the year candidate between uh, Yoani Jacek and Wiley Zhang? That's number one. Number two, uh, I don't know that Carla is the name that pops into my head immediately. But number three, and I'll let you address the first two and then we'll get to number three. Rose's camp has responded via Pat Berry, and we'll get to that after you talk about the first two. Yikes. Uh, Pat Berry making a case. <laughs> I mean, if I look at the top five in this division, because I do have the rankings open now that I've switched stations, Nina <laughs> Afra five. Well, she's inactive. Carla Spires a four. Yan Zhao Nan, Joanna Rose, Zhang Wei Li. So for me, yeah, Rose Nami Yunus fits the bill. And I think that you have to have the fight with Rose Nami Yunus. Now I know, you know, Pat Berry since come out and said, uh, you know, we want to keep it behind closed doors, so to speak. But yeah, who else? Who else? Do you have an all-China matchup between Yan Jonan and Zhang Wei Li? I'm all about it. I know Drake <laughs> Riggs is all about it. That'd be cool. Drake Riggs will be all about it for sure. I, I know he will. 
So it's a tough one to try and market. Um, to me, you don't do a rematch with Joanna. Like Carla's the only other one. You can build it as former champ, current champ. Carla's on a bit of a run. And you know what? I always used to say this about Carla Sparza. Gee, she always just adds a wrinkle to her game. You know, people really started to sleep on Carla Sparza at a point. I remember when she fought, who was it? Random Marcos. Everybody was so down on Carla Sparza. But she just keeps coming back. And now she just keeps winning. So why not? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. She does. She certainly does pose a different threat than Joanna would. Uh, one of the things Matt and I talked about was that when you have a prospect or someone that, you know, the thing with uh, Kevin Holland, right, is do you take Kevin Holland as someone who beat Jacare and now whatever you believe Jacare to be, Kevin Holland assumes that and moves forward? Or do you say to yourself, he beat Jacare, this is where Jacare is in the world, and let's throw him different wrinkles. Let's put him in with this kind of guy and that kind of guy so that he can round himself into a more well-rounded fighter. If that's what you want to do with Wiley, then yeah, you put her in there with Carla because Carla uh, has the takedown. She's just a different fighter than Yuan is. So it gives Wiley a different look and she can, you know, establish herself as a more um, diverse champion. So that's a thought. Let's talk about the Pat Barry of it all. So Pat Barry came out and said uh, about Dana saying Rose doesn't want the title shot. That is absolutely not true. We absolutely want the title fight. Who would turn down a title fight? We just don't want to air this out publicly. If there was some confusion, they can call us to clear it up. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot. When you look at Pat Berry and Rose Namajunas on a lot of fronts, there's a lot of things that just don't add up. There's a lot of things that don't make sense. There's a lot of things you don't want to dig too deeply into, uh, like th their respective ages, some of the mental health stuff with her. And I don't, I'm not even trying to make light of it. I'm just saying that she's got a lot of things – She's got a lot of demons that she wrestles with. We'll leave it at that. And um, I don't know how that plays into this. Um, I think she's one of the most talented fighters on her best night that I've ever seen. I mean, she, her ground game is amazing, and then she got the hands right with Trevor Whitman. She's a really, really diverse fighter. It just seems like she's either uninterested in the sport or I don't know, man. She just doesn't seem like her head's in it. She's like one of those basketball players that's a good player but does it love the sport? You know, Paul George would be an example. Paul George seems like he he's good at basketball, but doesn't love it. To me, it's kind of like Jonathan Chichu. You remember that time he scored 50 goals for the Sharks, and then it was like, where the hell's is Jonathan Chichu now? How Playing for the that? Ottawa Senators. So <laughs> it's it's a weird one for me. Um, I, I Yeah, I wish she was more active. I mean, the last time that I saw Rose Namajunas, this is going to sound so weird, and it's another Canadian reference. I was sitting on YouTube before we came on air and I was listening to music and I thought, you know what? I like Billy talent. I'll listen to a little bit of Billy talent. You remember that music video they did a year ago and they had Donald Cerrone and Rose Nami Yunus in it. It was so weird. So then I watched like the behind the music on it. It was like, Oh, well, so-and-so knew so-and-so. And then Rose Nami Yunus is here now. Now I don't know if Pat Berry was there now or was there then. And I don't know if he comment on it, but I'd like to know his level of involvement there because he seems to be way too involved. Why does he have to respond to comment on this one? If you had Jonathan Chichu and Billy Talent in your early stoppage bingo card, uh, congratulations, because I'm sure you weren't expecting to, to X those off tonight, but you have. All right, let's move on to the UFC uh, fan rankings. The UFC started fan rankings, and Craig, I'm going to keep this short and simple. Did the UFC do this to increase or enhance the fan experience or to show MMA fans – but they're probably worse at this than the panelists are. John, so I didn't know this existed until right now. So <laughs> I picked I picked a random division. I picked women's bantamweight. So you have your normal UFC rankings. You can play around with the fighters that are in there. And then you have a list of fighters that are unranked. So women's bantamweight. Shanna Young, Carol Hosa, Laura Procopio. Laura Procopio is not a, a Bantamweight. Sarah Morris, Bantamweight. Nico Montano, Vanessa Mello, Bia Malecki, Veronica Macedo, Flyweight. Liana Jojua, Stephanie Egger, Betch Cohea, Jessica Rose Clark, Diana Belbizia, Sarah Alper. Diana Belbizia is not a Bantamweight. She, her last Bantamweight fight was 2016 on the regional scene. What the fuck are we doing here? This is definitely like, not why they created these fan rankings. It's for you to go through and decide and, and, why? and it audit doesn't even the make sense. 
Like, light heavyweight. They have Alain Badeau in light heavyweight. Well, he's only had one fight in the UFC. It was at heavyweight. Like, I'm go Jake Collier. You can put Jake Collier in at light heavyweight. That guy's never going to make light heavyweight for the rest of his life. What are we doing? Uh, well, what you're doing is disregarding the question and going off on your own tangent. Vinicius Mojeda. <laughs> is he even in the UFC anymore? Nick Nega Moreno. He's not in the UFC. He's had a fight outside of the UFC. When did they start doing these fan rankings? Uh, recently. Uh, you know, what funny, are they I think, doing? I think they're using this as a social uh, social media marketing tool because a lot of what a lot of people are doing, unlike you, and just auditing the divisions, they're they going in. No, John, for men's flyweight, Myra Buena Silva's in there. She's yeah. a women's flyweight. Yeah, maybe maybe they had Reebok do this on the way out the door. Maybe Reebok coordinated the fan rankings. Is Demetrius oh Johnson God. in there? No, you know who should be because he's very Eduardo. famously no longer in the UFC. J Johnny Eduardo made it into the video game. Let's, you know what? Eric Silva made it into the video game too. Let's throw him there too. Let's do Forever it. Forever a prospect. Why do these exist, Craig? If I could get you back, if I could have you take your riddle and and uh, get you back on task, why do you think these um, the rankings exist? Somebody was sitting in an office somewhere in Las Vegas and went, "You know what? Craig Allen gets mad easy about stupid shit." Let's put these together and piss them off. You know, why did they we, do this? I, probably to get to generate fan interest. That's the only reason. But yeah, man, yeah. this is stupid. And I'll give it to them. I'll give them this. Um, all day on Twitter, which you must have missed, are people screenshotting their rankings and saying, like, you know, putting like a stupid fighter at number one. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Just to like, so they did gain some interest. Obviously, it didn't make it to you, so they didn't do that good of a job. But, um, you know, I think that for me, I think it's just to say, you guys want to complain about the rankings so much, here you go. And and the first time the fans have an out-of-whack division, because they will, of course, because they're fans, um, and, they'll, and they'll put their favorite fighter number one and the rankings will be all crazy, the UFC will say, so we got this guy ranked at fifth, and the fans have this guy ranked at fifth, and we're going to take their opinion on how the – this is going to be a way – for Dana to shove it up somebody's ass, that's for sure. Um, and as far as some guy sitting in his office, I don't know if he was sitting in his office looking to call out Craig Allen, but you know, when I was in the military, and this is all jobs, this isn't exclusive to the military, but we used to something would happen. We used to say, This is some guy justifying his existence and his job and saying, you know, Dana, I know you're cutting fighters. Don't start cutting staff. I just came out with the fan rankings. So, all right, let's move on. All right, Craig, I am super interested in this week's Start the Conversation because a uh, friend of the show, Dan Hooker, opened this can of worms earlier, so let's talk about it now. The lack of crowds at UFC events. Uh, and I'll just make this a very simple question, which is what effect, if any, we posed this on Reddit as well, what effect, if any, do you think lack of crowds have had, I'll say the sport, but this is a UFC thing. So what, what do you think, how do you think, not having crowds has affected UFC, positive or negative? I mean, yeah, I did throw it out there to Reddit. We've got, uh, you know, quite a few responses so far. The top comment by Carl, 100589. Uh, and his little tag up there is bowling, more popular than Nunes. So I'm sure Darren Ravel likes that one. His comment was, I think no crowd has been beneficial to technical fighters, guys who can be killers in the gym but struggle once the spotlight is on them. Fighters who are also very reliant on their coaches have also benefited from this. Part of the reason Gaethje did so well against Tony was due to having Whitman relaying everything to him clearly. To that, I would say, well, what about all the other fights that Justin Gaethje won with Whitman in his corner on his way back up after the Alvarez and Poirier losses? But I don't have to say it to his face. Uh, from <laughs> Sublime whose little tag is I'm the voice in Tony's walls from a fan perspective, the energy for some big fight, big fights feels different. Now it's a lot more of a calm before the storm where it's like a slow buildup and a large climax. Now that sounds Easy. like every Saturday night after the fights for me, but uh, <laughs> that's what uh, the voice in Tony's walls says from a business perspective, they probably took a big hit in merchandise sales. I've been to three UFC events and there were so many people that bought new merch, even though the price were insane, especially during a pay-per-view. The lines and booths were crazy, even longer than the bathroom lines. John, to tackle that one, I've been to a couple of UFC events. I've been to three. Yeah, I've been to three. I covered one. The one that I covered 
I was surprised because, you know, you do your typing and your question answering behind closed doors, and then you just walk out into the general population, and then you go and sit in your seat at the media row, you show your pass, and then when you decide, hey, I've been here for a little bit, I gotta, I gotta make we, you just go back through general population and piss where everybody else pisses. And so when I went to piss with everybody else, not that I'm above anybody, but like when I go to pee where everybody's peeing, there's like drunk guys beating up other drunk guys. And the RCMP were there arresting people as I'm just trying to be me wearing my suit and tie and making a wee to go back out and type some more questions to ask Artem Lobov. So like some of those UFC events are kind of weird. Yeah. You know, it's, here's my thing. And, and, um, I'm going to tell you where, where the start the conversation was inspired. I was watching Ch one of Chael Sonnen's videos, and he said, why isn't the Jorge Masvidal, Col Kobe Covington fight been booked yet? What are we waiting on? Masvidal's in, Covington's in, Dane is in, everybody's in. And the reason why I think it hasn't been booked yet, and I was doing some research for coming soon, end of the year awards, and I realized most champions only fought once last year. Now, Usman is a, is a little bit of an outlier because – go ahead. Tell me where I'm wrong. A lot of people pointed to this, and, and I'll try and find one of the comments here. Yeah, one guy here, Adam Buddy. Actually, no, it's uh, – I'm sure this one is taken, and I'm going to read the tag. Likes it raw in dad ass. Now, he got no points uh, for, the, for the post, but he gets style points for that tag. Most UFC champions fight once a year in the best years. I think only the biggest names are being held back right now, which none of the people you named are. Conor McGregor, for example, has likely been shelved for as long as they can, hoping to get a gate. Now, the fighters that I named, actually, I should say, Pyotr Jan, uh, uh, Volkanovski, and Kamaru Usman. Those were just the champs that I went, oh, well, they've only fought once. Yeah, I don't really like... I don't like the comment, but I I do agree. I mean, there's I think they're holding them. I I think they're holding these guys out for the gates. Yeah, and and I think that you know they they wanted to get Connor on the books. They're hoping this vaccine's gonna do whatever. You know, I'm sure if Dana had his way, he'd get you know twenty five thousand vaccines off a truck that some you know some made guy stole, and then he'd give them all to a bunch of fans and have them show up at uh, T-Mobile Arena. But, yeah, I think that's the case. I mean, Stipe is a, a tough case because he he kind of picks and chooses when he wants to fight. So, uh, you know, Jones, similar, same thing. Adesanya's pretty active, though. Um, Usman had a fight fall out, so that's a little bit unfair. Um, 55, Khabib, I think he's fought once. But he it, here's the thing. Once you become champion, and this is where I do agree with this comment, once you become champion, I don't care who you are, the day you win the title belt, you know the next day what you're going to do, no matter who you are? Man, that knee that's been bugging me, I think I'm going to get surgery on that. My shoulder's been hurt. and I think Because you want to keep the belt. No one wants to win the belt in July and lose the belt in August. So they're going to take their time booking these fights. But I do think there's something, too, that Dana wants the bigger fighters to fight where there's a gate. Especially the Connor. The Jermaine Durandamy effect there. <laughs> exactly. But I think, I think that's what's keeping Covington and – um and Mas Masvidal out of the cage. For sure. No, I agree. All right, Craig. This episode of Early Stoppage is in the books. Craig can be followed at Craig Allen FMP. I can be followed at SM Cornerman. The fight has been stopped. We'll see you next week. Craig, say something witty. John, I'm not going to say anything witty. I'm going to leave you with this. It's been a crazy year with Fight Night Picks. It's been a crazy episode. It's been a weird episode because I've changed sides of the room. And you're still, uh, apparently dogs are coming for you in your bunker. So that's good. The planes have left, but the dogs are here. So they're close. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to the year-end stuff with Fight Night Picks. I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, we brought back this week in MMA. We get the recap show. We've got early stoppage. We've got question mark kicks. we got picks. Uh, uh, you know, inside baseball, i got a couple meetings at the end of the week with some guys uh looking to do some big things so yeah there's all sorts of stuff coming with fighting picks that uh, that's really excited uh or exciting i'm so excited that i can't form sentences so yeah just uh stay on the lookout for some of the the neat fighting pick stuff coming out soon i agree and i'll just say this from my perspective you know I, I think the one of the things i like about the channel the most i hope this is what you guys like about the channel the most is that we kind of do a pretty good job i think of like bookending things right like craig and matt set them up 
you know, and then me and Matt recap them. And then Craig and I are in the middle talking about the stories of the day. And then this week, so it's not like you get fresh perspectives, but in each show, there's a piece of familiarity from something else, right? You know, me and Craig have our own vibe. Craig and Matt have their own vibe. Me and Matt have our own vibe. That's what I like about it is instead of like you guys listening to like two completely different guys, there's a little bit of familiarity in each show, which I think is cool. All right, guys, there you have it. Hit us up on all social media. Blast us in the comments. That's my favorite. Um, and, uh, you know, check out Spotify, check out Apple Podcasts, do all that stuff. And hopefully we can get the year end stuff uh, rocking and rolling. You guys will like it. See you next time. Peace.